What is it with characters in movies with active chess boards and no one to play with? Is it to subtly remind the audience that this guy is smart, as if the two hours of movie wouldn't be able to cover that on its own? You actually fought to get reassigned here. Yeah, what the f**k's up with that, by the way? Mills mentions in passing he wants to do some good, but that is the only reason he moves him and poor Gwyneth to this godforsaken city. Gonna remove a sin for the opening credits. Yep, the opening credits, which were revolutionary and set the proper mood for the f**k up movie you're about to see. Often, when you are insane, you feel the need to black out words on a pregnancy and your sense of smell article. If the public were to get their hands on this information, many of our top spies overseas would be discovered. I mean, really, the only thing the opening credits shows us is that John Doe is an excellent scrapbooker. As we will soon find out, about a third of this movie will be people putting on ties. The other third will be scenes in the rain. And yet, despite this, the movie remains a masterpiece. Discuss. This unknown city, lost, new, Angel York, will have constant rain for seven days and absolutely no flooding. Wait a minute, no one bothers with vital signs? Did I stutter? This guy ain't breathing unless he started breathing spaghetti sauce. I know this cop's not a detective, but is that seriously this asshole's criteria for confirming this dude's death? Sure, the victim's in terrible shape, and the fact that he's toast is pretty obvious, but even a f***ing rent -a cop would check vital signs. Also, we've seen that the electricity works, since the TVs and lights are on in the living room, so could they not put on an overhead in the kitchen? Or is it against this movie's rules to have any lighting? Who said this was murder? No one. Then why the sh was Homicide immediately called in to investigate? Oh, wonderful. Very moody. David Fincher's reactions to the dailies somehow made it into the script. As you can tell, this movie was supposed to be the story of Noah at one point. The original script followed the Bible closely, but they added a Seven Deadly Sins plot and changed all the characters. The rain, though, stayed. How the fat f ever fit out his front door? Please, it's obvious he was a shut-in. A shut-in who never went outside, and yet angered John Doe so much at the sight of him that he needed to kill him. I'm wondering, did John Doe answer help wanted ads for people who were recluses until he found his gluttony? This was 1995, so e-gluttony wasn't around then. The bucket beneath him kept on serving. Took his time, too. Coroner said this could have gone on for more than 12 hours. What a hilariously specific time frame this coroner came up with. I mean, does he have previous experience on a case where someone was forced to eat himself to death? I made a second trip to the supermarket. So? Hey, man. Here's the thing. I've been out in the rain all day. After spending the last several minutes bitching about being taken seriously as a detective, Detective Mills here refuses to provide any details on his first case in the precinct. This is Metro. You don't just get to swap. Give it to me. No. I'm putting you on something else. What the f***, Sergeant Hartman? Which is it? Can you swap cases or can't you? I'm beginning to think John Doe didn't hate people because of their deadly sins, but because they had two TVs. The lawyer here and the gluttony guy earlier. We're going to go live downtown with defense attorney Eli Gould was found murdered. Did the forensics guys turn on the TVs to have some background noise while they were working on the crime scene? Because otherwise, this is extremely convenient. Not only are they on, but that Mills comes in right as the press conference for the very case he's working on begins. I know they're probably still unpacking their clothes from the move, but geez, did Mills specifically order this shirt with extra wrinkles? Have you heard the news? Nope, haven't heard. Eli Gould was found murdered this morning. But every newspaper in town had this story as their headline. Even if Gould were discovered early in the morning, there's no way all the newspapers would be able to stop the presses and get this entire story printed. This keep out sticker was placed on the inside of the door of a crime scene. I guess, as a prank? Oh, Lord. John Doe was betting so much on Somerset's great detective skills that he fed his victim wood shards from the floor in front of the refrigerator. Look, I'm not knocking Somerset. This was a terrific deduction. But the fact that Doe knew he'd be able to figure it out is yet more bullshit in this bullshitty plan. Sloth, wrath, pride, lust, and envy. Seven. Roll credits. Where are you headed? Far away from here. That's great, pal, but I need a destination. Otherwise, we're going to the default far away from here, which is Manhattan, Kansas. A world of knowledge at your fingertips. And what do you do? You play poker all night. The economy was great back in 1995 because libraries could afford to have multiple night watchmen guarding books overnight that nobody wants to read anyway. Hey, we got culture. How's this for culture? Sick burn, man, but do these assholes really sit around and listen to Bach when they play poker? Reading. Really getting the feeling that Somerset's just skipping right to the pictures in these great works of literature. Probably on the off chance he might see some hand-drawn boobs. Somerset writes a note to Mills telling him he might want to check out some books on the seven deadly sins, probably to understand the killer better. But how the f*** does that get them closer to the killer? It literally could be anyone. I feel like this is something a smart person tells themselves they need to do, but they end up wasting time reading the Canterbury Tales when they should be interviewing all the Catholics in the area. Apparently, after a 16-hour copying scene, Somerset was able to fit all those copies into an envelope without massively inflating it. Seriously, my guess is that David Fincher held stock in a rain machine company when he decided to do this project. Why aren't you married, William? 
I'm less concerned about this semi-inappropriate question than I am the previous conversation was boring enough that Somerset started folding a f***ing napkin to keep his attention. The real estate guy. Shows us the place a few times. Start wondering why will he only bring us here for five minutes at a time, yeah? You guys were shopping for apartments, and you agreed to look at one several times, five minutes at a time. And by the way, how did this real estate guy time the f***ing train so well during that many visits? <laughs> God damn, I love this cast. Now listen, the body was found on Tuesday morning. The office was closed on Monday, which means the guy could have gotten in on Friday, laid low till the cleaning crew left, then had his way with Gould all day Saturday. They'll go on to explain that his wife was out of town during all of this, but she didn't try to contact her husband for four days? Which what? Patrician. It's when you regret your sins, but not because you love God. Religious issue. Safe house that's supposed to be a house of safety leaves the front door wide the f*** open. Luckily, all these shots of a dead Gould are the perfect size to be redacted with a regular post-it note. You meant what you said, Mrs. Gould, didn't you? About catching this guy. Funny, I watched that scene, and I don't remember Mills ever telling Mrs. Gould that he wanted to catch this guy. It may have happened off-screen, but that shit doesn't count. Picking up diamonds on a deserted island. Saving them in case we get rescued. Bullshit. Thankfully, Mills interjects here, because Somerset was running low on metaphors for the emptiness of life of a detective in this town. He's got a long history of serious mental illness. His parents gave him a very strict Southern Baptist upbringing. Since I added this stupidly specific last detail to this briefing, I'd also like to mention that his favorite food is lasagna, he loves Mad About You, and he prefers blue underwear. The guy they're about to arrest is victim number three, the sloth victim. Sloth, defined by the Catholic faith, is first and foremost very hard to define. It's basically a person who can't move, who doesn't care about himself or others. John Doe apparently defines it as almost every criminal's rap sheet. His lawyer, by the way, has recently ceased Eli Gould. Why the sh is the captain continuing this briefing while walking the entire team down a staircase? This ensures that only part of the team will actually hear the information. Apparently, the police do not believe any other crime is scheduled today, and send the entire force to pick up a guy who's easily been arrested several times in the past. Never, never, took, a, never took a bullet, but I uh, pulled my gun once, shot it once. Gun shadowing. Swap goes before dicks. Then why the hell weren't you at the front of the fucking line then? Gotta ask, if this guy smells this bad, would air fresheners really conceal it? Wouldn't the neighbors smell him anyway? Even so, is the mix of every different air freshener scent really that more appealing than the funk of this dude's rotting body? I think it's hilarious that John Doe hung tons of air fresheners on the ceiling, but decided to hang one on the lamp just for good measure. You got what you deserved. <coughs> okay guys, this is one of the most intense moments in film history here. It's set up so well. I mean, there's no way this guy's alive, right? And he's not the killer, so there's nothing in your brain that tells you this scare is coming. It deserves five sins off, and therefore we will grant it. He's experienced about as much pain and suffering as anyone I've encountered, give or take. And he still has hell to look forward to. Jesus Christ, it sounds like this doctor is on his last week of work. Don't let this guy near any family members after a car crash. Sorry folks, your son died from horrible brain injuries sustained in the crash. I just wanted you to hear it from me that God is dead and no one cares, to quote a favorite musician of mine. Also, give or take what? Has this doctor seen a case that's anywhere near this level of suffering? You know, the kind of suffering that makes you eat your own f***ing tongue? I hate this city. I had a relationship once. God damn, Somerset, why do you always have to make it about you? Damn, looks like Mills and Somerset are confident which deaths will take place next, the way this list is numbered. To break up the monotony of the crime scene footage, the fellas throw the top ten combat handguns up on the wall. We walked into that apartment exactly one year after he tied Victor to the bed. One year to the day. He wanted us to. Don't know that for sure. Oh, yes, we do. Yeah, but how? Remember this required the lawyer's wife to notice a painting in his office was upside down, which required a good detective to dust the wall for fingerprints. If this had been just Mills on the case, they would have missed that anniversary. He's a nutbag. And just because a uh, f***er's got a library card doesn't make him Yoda. Mills pulls out the Dr. House moment with a random quote about a f***ing library card, which inspires Somerset to pay a guy to figure out who's checking out certain books at the library. Yep, there was a Brad Pitt eat something in every movie he's in cliche, even way back in 1995. If you want to know who's reading Purgatory and Paradise Lost and Helter Skelter, the FBI's computers will tell us. You mean they flagged Purgatory and Paradise Lost? What the f*** for? When Somerset said the stuff about nuclear weapons and Hitler, that made sense. But stuff that a freshman in high school would check out? Are you f***ing kidding me? Is that it? Jonathan Doe? Library ex machina. You mean to tell me the guy who planned these murders actually checked out books from a f***ing library? Rather than paying cash to some bookstore for these books? The guy is apparently wealthy, so why the rentals? Also, he was able to use the alias Jonathan Doe, but he couldn't get away with making up a fake address? Not to mention, why even use Jonathan Doe? Why not Daryl Bishop or something less conspicuous? Mills. 
Luckily for everyone involved in this scene, John Doe went to the Stormtrooper School of Aiming. If Doe is trying to get away, then why is he hanging around waiting to shoot blind shots up a staircase to try and kill Detective Mills? Doe somehow managed to make it out of this window without disturbing anything on the sink or knocking over the pill bottles on the windowsill. Look, I love David Fincher, and he does beautiful movies. But the fact that I can't tell who is where and where they are in relation to each other makes me think this action scene is no better than something in Resident Evil Apocalypse. Rather than just braking to avoid hitting the man running in the middle of the street, this cab driver thinks the better option is to potentially kill many people on the sidewalk. Considering that John Doe doesn't kill David after this, what's the f***ing point? He could have hid up here for hours and no one would have noticed. You might say this is part of his new plan, but Somerset could easily be seconds away and f*** this whole thing up. Where are you going? Going in. No, 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 wait, wait. So neither of you guys are going to call back to the station, reporting the assault of an officer and probably some dead-ass pedestrians? God damn it! Look, I'm sure this happens, and the movie's got a long way to show us how Mills feeds on his emotions and crap. But come on, even a guy who's as pissed as he is would be able to listen to reason here and know that breaking down this door is the end of getting a conviction. Then they pay some homeless person to come up with an eyewitness account. Like, that's gonna hold up in court. Did you know someone actually took the time to write all this stuff out to be seen for mere seconds in a movie? That's some detail right there. It's almost like David Fincher knew there would be some dickhead YouTube channel trying to point out flaws in this awesome movie 22 years later. What? We had it. Mills discovers that the photographer he told to f*** off earlier is the guy they were looking for. But how would they have had him? Even if he let the guy take pictures and ask questions and shit, would they have figured out that he was the killer? Sure, this is him. Yeah, good, good. Yep. Wow. Based on this sketch artist, the real surprise ending to this movie is that John Doe is played by Patrick Stewart. On the subway today, a man came up to me to start a conversation. He made small talk, this lonely man talking about the weather and other things. You get the feeling that John Doe wrote all these volumes of his journal in the hopes that they would one day be read in the voice of Morgan Freeman. Somerset turns on his tape recorder and holds it in a place that in no way will pick up John Doe's voice so clearly. But it does anyway. Look, we know him, we know him, we know him. Who's the blonde? This is where you realize John Doe doesn't really have a plan for all seven murders right now. Because all the cops can find in his apartment is the very next victim, and none of the ones after that. And yet, John Doe knew he was going to chain the sloth guy to a bed for a whole year and intended him to be a third death, which suggests a very particular plan. So, why can't they find the others? Meanwhile, he's taken photos of all his victims, all the way through victim four. But not victim five, the pride victim. Seriously, even if he's planning on becoming Envy and Mills becoming Wrath, he should at least have the pride victim photographed. Someone they should be able to find and prevent the murder, even, since she's a popular model. And there's no way John Doe knew he'd be Envy and that the recently reassigned David would be the Wrath one year in advance. John Doe, it's an easy name to remember, he had a limp. Hard to determine if John Doe was walking with a limp because of the fight with Mills or because he was still in character as a verbal kint, considering the movies came out within a week of each other. He asked me if I was married. So wait, John knew he could go to this underground prostitution place to kill the lust victim, but didn't know who he was going to get to do that until that day? Also, does a prostitute really count as lust when they're doing it for the money? This guy's been planning his murder spree for years, observing all sorts of people and writing about it in his diaries, and he didn't run into a man cheating on his wife or something to that effect? I love you, honey, so much. Oh yeah, remember Gwyneth Paltrow being in this movie? Movie is overtly reminding you of that before the final act for no reason at all. Before he goes to sleep every night, Morgan Freeman practices his unflappable stare at the wall, which is rightfully intimidated. F you, metronome! What did you got? I mean, come on. This is apparently a well known model, and he didn't have a picture of her anywhere in the apartment. He didn't plan this murder yesterday. Detective! Jesus, think about John Doe's Sunday. He kills the pride victim the night before. He waits around for David to go to work, then he tries to play husband with Tracy, and it doesn't work out. So he kills Tracy, puts her head in a box, finds a guy who can deliver the box by seven to some remote location, finds a willing taxi driver to drive him, with his bloody clothes, to the police station, no questions asked. The client also wishes to inform you that if you do not accept, he will plead insanity across the board. Because after all, the insanity plea is used successfully in so many cases. Not to mention the fact that you don't just get to go free when you plead insanity. You have to go to a mental hospital and live your life as Sarah Connor. If you were to claim insanity, this conversation is admissible. Two more are dead. The press would have a field day if they were to find out the police didn't seem too concerned about finding them. Yeah, but they're technically already dead. And these are very detective-y detectives, so they'd presumably be able to track these bodies down over time. Basically, I'm saying that even though they don't know the last two victims are Tracy and John Doe, this is a flimsy f***ing reason to go along with this plan. <laughs> I'm enjoying life right now. We caught the killer, and my wife remains completely unbeheaded. Such weird thoughts I have in times like these. Sure, what this neo-noir gruesome detective movie needs is yet another police officer's gearing up for battle montage. Could the freak be any more vague? I can't wait for you to see. I really can't. This ends up being an amazing scene, but it's easy to forget that the first several minutes consist of Mills and Doe vagely trading innocuous insults. An obese man 
A disgusting man who could barely stand up. A man who, if you saw him on the street, you'd point him out to your friends. Yeah, but I'm still trying to figure out when you actually saw this guy, a shut-in who never wandered outside. Only in a world this shitty. Could you even try to say these were innocent people and keep a straight face? I mean, you had to know it was coming for Spacey's performance alone, right? We see a deadly sin on every street corner, in every home, and we tolerate it. John Doe just described what it's like for cinema sins to see a movie like Fate of the Furious become a hit, not only in theaters, but on Blu-ray. In fact, one could say that the whole franchise is the seven deadly sins of cinema. And oh wait, here's 15 more because we hate God. Mills. The fact that this van is allowed to get anywhere near these assholes while they're supposedly under heavy surveillance is the least believable thing in this movie. This guy paid me 500 bucks to bring it out here, man. He said he wanted it here at exactly 7 o'clock. He was covered in blood, but he seemed like a nice guy. I know Somerset knows this killer wouldn't put a bomb in this box, but you have to be sh** me that he's going to open it right here now without truly knowing what it is. And luckily for John Doe, he does, because if he follows the normal procedure, Mills never gets a chance to kill him. John Doe has the upper hand. John Doe was certain that Somerset would be this f***ing far away so that he could tell Mills about killing his wife before he got back and was able to talk sense into him. I wish I could have lived like you did. Shut up. Man, this reveal is terrific. It really is. But the envy part of this equation feels forced as hell, doesn't it? In the car, Doe was openly contemptuous of Mills, but now, as long as he says he admires him, this qualifies as a sin? Really think that just chopping off his wife's head was proof enough? Because I envy your normal life. Put the gun down, David. It seems that envy is my sin. Uh, let's talk about John Doe's plan. He planned seven murders to represent the seven deadly sins. But there's no f***ing way he knew he would be Envy and that he'd get someone to become Wrath once he told him what he did. Luckily, he ran into hothead David Mills while he was committing the murders and decided to change his plan midstream. Also luckily for Doe, he did not kill an Envy or Wrath before this. And Doe somehow doesn't see that killing Tracy f***s up the seven deadly sin murders. Tracy isn't part of the motif, and David isn't going to die for being Wrath unless it's some sort of symbolic death. I think John knew that finding a high-profile Envy was going to be next to impossible, so he copped out and decided, shrug, I guess I'm Envy then, f*** it. Christ. Somebody call somebody. This statement is an excellent encapsulation of the effectiveness of this f***ing police force. Ernest Hemingway once wrote, The world is a fine place, and worth fighting for. I agree with the second part. Despite some clear inconsistencies in this movie, this line, the experience of this movie, let's just remove seven cents. You know, just because. The heart. Yes, this is an awesome song and a fantastic credit sequence, but I still need to take all of the showers after watching this f***ing movie, so no time to watch all of it. Oh, what's in the box? Finally, monsieur, a waffle thin mint. No, f*** off, I'm full. Oh, sir. If you survive recruit training, you will be a minister of death praying for war. I hate this city. Say my name. Heisenberg. You're goddamn right. Do you know what crazy is? Crazy is majority rules. Yeah. Ah. Uh, take germs, for example. Germs. In the 18th century, no such thing. There's a harsh truth to face. No way I'm gonna make it on the outside. I will beat you like a Cherokee drop. First you have to know, not fear. No, and someday you're gonna die. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. <laughs>